the, in the expanding universe, we are told, and I have to believe it, that everywhere is, as it were, the same as everywhere else. There's no one place which is the edge of the universe. How can that be? Well, Lawrence, for a long time, people wondered, is the universe expanding or is it steady state? Then people asked, okay, it's expanding, but it's kind of a, at a decelling rate because of gravity. And then suddenly, a little less than 10 years ago, it's like a revelation that the universe is not only expanding, but the accelera it's accelerating and it's expanding. Help us understand that. Well, I, I w in some sense, I wish I could because it's the biggest, probably the biggest mystery in science right now is, is why. Is, uh, did the universe begin? I think that's a better question because we still don't know the answer to the question, did the universe begin? You would sometimes get the impression that we know because cosmologists like myself talking to a wider audience sometimes pretend that we know the answer to this. Okay, so, so you can't see the universe before it existed. Before you can use geometry to do any type of calculations or predictions in gravitational physics, you need to have a properly defined set of boundaries. In other words, you need to know how much mass is confined to a specific amount of space. Boundaries are how physicists are able to describe the gravitational field of a particular object, a star, a galaxy, whatever the object is. But boundaries are all arbitrary. They're just defined by some arbitrary line. Take the Earth, for instance. The Earth is not a perfect sphere. The Earth also has an atmosphere that extends beyond the visible edge of Earth. In other words, the mass or gravity of an object is not defined by some arbitrary boundary. It's a false premise. Thus far, the common practice is to arbitrarily define gravitational boundaries and just assume the solutions are close enough. All mass outside of the boundary is ignored. Consider the moon. The boundary for the Earth is here, where the arrow is pointing, but it really depends on the specific measurement you're talking about. The Earth has mountains. The Earth has trees. It's not a perfect sphere. The boundaries of Earth are just arbitrarily defined. There are things in orbit around Earth. There's, a, there's an atmosphere. There's the moon. If our mission is to define the gravitational field for a region of the universe, we need to include all of the mass that is relevant to that particular region. In other words, gravity is relative. Let's say we want to describe the orbit of a planet around a star. We can use arbitrary boundaries to describe the gravitational field. We draw a ball here and another ball there. By drawing a ball, Mathematically, I mean we are defining the boundary or the radius. It's, it's, we're actually calling this an object. In reality, it's a collection of objects. It's a bunch of atoms. We draw a boundary and we say there's X amount of mass confined to the volume of R. Well, that's fine and dandy, but when you're talking about gravitational physics, the area surrounding that boundary actually has mass. No matter where you draw the boundary, if you draw the boundary anywhere in the universe, there's going to be mass on the other side of that boundary. So this gives us a great starting point, but what if we involve multiple planets or stars? We just draw more circles. To be perfectly accurate, you need to include everything, literally. It can become overwhelming if you're using differential geometry. Every galaxy, star, planet, speck of dust, every atom, every proton, Every single drop of mass needs to be included, if you want to be perfectly accurate. Now, it doesn't make sense to be perfectly accurate on most scales, because you can get it close enough. But that is the problem. The scale of the universe is enormous. Astronomers and cosmologists use different standards for different scales. In other words, what they deem as a relevant account for the solar system is different than what is deemed relevant for galaxies or clusters of galaxies or super clusters of galaxies. The entire purpose of this video is to discredit the Doppler interpretation of the cosmological redshift, Hubble's law. Now, if you're unaware, the cosmological redshift or Hubble's redshift, Hubble's law, the Hubble flow, there's all these different names for it. 
That's the entire foundation for the expanding universe and the Big Bang Theory. The redshift is a distance proportional decrease in the frequency of starlight. This degradation of light is believed to be caused by some unknown repulsive force that pushes galaxies away from one another. I believe the Hubble redshift is gravitational redshift. That's all. And that is because they have misinterpreted these boundaries. There are objects unaccounted for. Lots of objects and lots of mass in between the objects with boundaries. There is no such thing as empty space. Now, gravitational redshift occurs when light is emitted within a gravitational well and observed within a lesser gravitational well. Let's say you want to predict the amount of redshift coming from a particular star. To know the change in frequency due to gravity, we need to know the parameters of the emitting star and the receiving body. We also need to know the parameters of the surrounding region as well. These additional objects must play a role in the exchange. Let's say a star emits a light wave, and we want to determine the amount of gravitational redshift for that light for various observers. We place an observer here, 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 and here, and here. Let's say there's a gradient to the mass of the star, but there is nothing in between the first observer and this point here. We can call this the boundary of the star and try to a redshift for these observers. Now we place an observer here. At this point, there is much more gravitational redshift. Let's place another observer here and here. The same logic is true for all scales. More mass equals more redshift. The truth of the matter is that there is no boundary. There is no area where you stop and gravity stops affecting an object. In the words of Alfred North Whitehead, the misconception which has haunted philosophical literature throughout the centuries is the notion of independent existence. There is no such mode of existence. Every entity is to be understood in terms of the way it is interwoven with the rest of the universe. Physicists give credence to this mythological substance they call asymptotically flat space. It's basically the baseline for all spatial temporal interactions in this universe. The problem with flat space is that it doesn't exist. There is only mass. The only way to describe flat space is to describe it as the A. The only way to describe space is to describe the only way... Hmm, uh, the space part. What is that black stuff, that dark stuff that is between the Earth and the Moon? That's where we're having a problem, a major problem, and, and, and uh, a, a problem that people have not been able to overcome. That's that's the issue. The issue is that we don't know what that dark stuff is, or people have different uh, ideas about it, or, um, or 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 they use things which uh, they, they or they introduce things into their theories which they have not justified because of general relativity the only way that you can actually define space is to use the amount of mass in the region and the only way to do that is to use the density and so to say that this region of space has this density you're actually saying that this is one chunk of mass the space in between it is is going to be present no matter how tight or separated they are there's still space in between things even if they're touching there's still space right atoms electrons they're all moving around there is no defined boundary there are there is no such thing as a defined boundary especially when you're talking about gravity the universe is not empty it has a certain amount of density so what is the gravitational redshift scientists act like it's only stars that have a gravitational redshift but there is it's the point at which the star when it comes to gravitational physics these arbitrary boundaries that we use may be helpful but ultimately they're irrelevant on the cosmological scale if you're t if you ever can discuss the gravitational redshift of a galaxy you can also discuss the gravitational redshift of larger scale objects superclusters veins filaments we're talking about millions or billions or trillions of galaxies. These objects also have gravitational redshift. The gravitational redshift of a star is the exact same principle because why not use the gravitational redshift of the emitting atom? And that's ultimately what you're doing, right? So why not just take the, the amount of mass uh, that's in the, sink, the one atom? Why do you worry about the region of the atom's location? Why does the rest of the star influence the atom? Because it's there? 
Well, it's also in the galaxy, so you use the rest of the galaxy. I mean, if you're outside of the galaxy, if the observer is outside of the galaxy, there's going to be a shit. It's so scary. It's all very, very confusing and hard to explain and difficult to talk about, but but I'm really compelled to, to share this idea. So, um, in short, cosmologists have given preference to a particular scale based on arbitrarily defined boundaries like star and galaxy. Now, this tragic error means the lion's share of gravitational redshift has been ignored. This means the Doppler interpretation of the Hubble redshift is not necessary. The universe is not expanding. There's a lot more information to this than I can cover in a single video. So in future videos, uh, I'll dive further into gravitational redshift, including the equation I use to predict Hubble's law. I'll explain why mass density is inversely proportional to the radius of the scale. We'll also talk about space and time, and hopefully I'll have a guest for that one. Uh, we're going to discuss dark matter and dark energy's relationship to this problem. And I'll explain the origins of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, of course, I know this all sounds grandiose and everything, but once the idea is fully envisioned, the entire problem falls into place like a bunch of dominoes. That's why I'm so compelled to share it. And it's extremely simple. You just have to assume that boundaries are not real, which they're not. I mean, this is... This is the default. Um, now, if you... If you're dying to learn more, uh, watch out for my future videos, hit subscribe, uh, post any questions you may have, check out my website, that's uh, theuniverseisnotexpanding.com. Uh, you can also buy my book from Amazon, the links are going to be in the description below. So, thank you for watching, I hope you have a wonderful day.